This is episode number 18 with Tony Amendola. Coming up. In the back room of the store, you're, you're working on your dreams because you know you are more than that. An old professor of mine said, You know, the students really, really like you. They don't understand the thing you're saying, but they really like you. <laughs> you know what? Yes, I've made a mistake. That's not all I am. I'm also the other 999 times when I went on and did reasonably well. Because anyone who comes to LA who doesn't think they have a for sale sign out, <laughs> you're wondering,、well, what do you come to LA for? It's like, you know, Nina says at the end of the seagull. What I discovered is that the most important thing is the ability to endure. I think my love is rare as any she that lied with false confession. Hey there, my name is Nathan Agan, and this is the Working Actors Journey, bringing you in depth conversations with actors that have been working professionally for decades. Hope you're doing well out there. We continue season two today, and if you're just joining us, we have a number of fantastic episodes where working actors share where they've been, how they do it, and what they've learned along the way. Actors who have been putting in the work day in, day out, and who have certainly had their ups and downs like everyone else. These conversations are meant to inspire and reassure you on your journey. That you're not alone, you're not crazy, and though the road may be long and challenging, there are rewards ahead. And I really want to help you as an actor out there. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss anything ahead and visit the website workingactorsjourney.com where you can get a copy of the guide 12 Top Acting Tips from Season 1. These are some of the best ideas taken from all the episodes compiled in one place. And it's waiting for you. There's also a link in the episode description. Today on the show is Tony Amendola, a working actor with over 40 years in the business. He navigates between stage, screen, and voiceovers, from leading parts to characters and everything in between. Tony's simple dream years ago to work as an actor would take him to Mexico, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, England, Bulgaria, Canada, and across the United States. He's well known to audiences for his work on the shows Stargate SG-1, Continuum, and Once Upon a Time. Some of his theatrical roles include Cyrano, Iago, Uncle Vanya, Cassius, Malvolio, Petruchio, and Mark Antony. In our chat, Tony talked about why he loves being an actor, and the phrase from truck drivers to Shakespearean kings came up, and I thought that not only did that describe his own career really well, but could also have been a great title for this episode. That's really what you have the opportunity to do in this career, to play so many different types of people in so many different situations, and it can definitely be the working actor's life. Now, Tony has been an actor that I've admired, and I've actually been a little bit intimidated by him. And we chat about the perceptions by others that actors have to navigate. Of course, as usually is the case, there was no reason for my hesitations at all. Tony is such a warm and giving person, and we had a fantastic chat. And years ago, when I first got to know him on stage, it was cool to go back and see that I definitely noticed him in works like Seinfeld and The Mask of Zorro. And one of my favorite projects that I ever saw Tony do was a reading of the play The Father in Los Angeles. It's a really wonderful play, and I thought that Tony was just phenomenal in it. So, in today's episode, Tony and I cover getting nervous about auditions and loving it. Being petrified over a particular role and having no faith in himself to do it, his first TV job in LA and how the director helped him through it, what he learned coming back to Merchant of Venice twenty five years later as an actor, Tony's daily routine of body, mind, and spirit, advice he would give to smart, driven students of acting, surrounding yourself with people you respect. 
one of his favorite failure stories and how it led him to Los Angeles, plus a whole lot more. And Tony also lets us in on how he works through Shakespeare's sonnet number 130. Having great mentors and access to outstanding teachers can make the difference in your career. And that's what this show is hoping to do, to connect you with actors that could change your life and make your acting journey easier and more satisfying. And if you'd like to get exclusive access to additional episodes, bonus content, and items that are available nowhere else, I invite you to become a premium member of the Working Actors Journey, starting at just $2 per month at workingactorsjourney.com slash premium. Just to give you an idea of benefits, I recently sent out an exclusive bonus episode with Robert Pine from episode number one. Members learned more about what he looks for in a script, and also how the current state of business, including with services like Netflix, is affecting the middle-class performer. More great insights into the life of a working actor. And they also got to know before anyone else who today's guest was. So if those kinds of insider scoops and bonus content are up your alley, become a premium member. Again, just $2 per month to get started. Plus, by joining, you're ensuring that this show continues. Consider this the most inexpensive and possibly most valuable acting class you'll ever take. Join now at workingactorsjourney.com slash premium or see the show notes and episode description for a link. Now, here's a bit more about Tony's journey. He grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, into a blue-collar family. He was the first member of his family to attend college, graduating from Southern Connecticut State University and then receiving his MFA from Temple University. He has over 120 credits on film and TV, including as a series regular on Continuum and recurring work on Stargate SG-1, CSI, Dexter, and Once Upon a Time as Pinocchio's father, Geppetto. He's appeared as the title character in Uncle Vanya and King Lear, as King Henry in Lion in Winter, and as Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. Tony was an associate artist, actor, and director at the Berkeley Rep Theater for 10 years. Regional theater work includes the Mark Taper Forum, South Coast Rep, ACT, The Old Globe, La Jolla Playhouse, Williamstown Theater, Center Stage, and the Oregon, California, and Utah Shakespeare Festivals. Voiceover work includes video games World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XV, and Call of Duty, and as the narrator of The Land Before Time, fourteen. Tony was recently seen on stage as the detective Hercule Poirot in Murder on the Orient Express at La Mirada Theater. He's a founding member of the Antias Company in Los Angeles, and recent performances with them include roles in Hedda Gabler, Mrs. Warren's Profession, and as Jayquees in As You Like It, for which he was nominated for an L.A. Ovation Award. Are you looking for more info from industry insiders and great teachers about being an actor? And do you want this as something you can listen to on the go? Well, you're in luck. As a listener of the Working Actors Journey podcast, Audible is offering you a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial. Whether it's one hour or 15 hours, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want, that first item is totally free. To download your audiobook today, go to workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Here are a few recommendations for your acting journey. The Actor's Life by Jenna Fisher from The Office, read by the author and others, including our guest, Reed Burney. Secrets of Screen Acting by Patrick Tucker, a TV and film director, read by David Lawrence the 17th. Respect for Acting by Uta Hagen, read by Angel Masters. Get one of these or anything else at workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Tony and I had a wonderful chat full of humor and honesty. He was such a fantastic guest, and I'm truly honored that he's on the show. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode and all the lessons that Tony learned along the way throughout his life of being a working actor. 
And make sure you stick around for Tony working on Shakespeare's Sonnet 130, along with his own personal favorite failure story. So here we go with episode number 18. Please enjoy my chat with Tony Amendola. So you said you had an audition. What was the audition for today? Oh, God. It's, uh, it's for a new uh, sort of limited series about the uh, Harlem mobsters and, uh, you know, about New York and, uh, hmm. you know, the thing between the Irish, the Italians. And it, it's actually sort of an interesting project. Is it uh, like a online or network or? No, 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 no. It's a it's a it's a cable. It's a okay. yeah, Got it. cable one. So, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it brings up the question. Do you still get nervous with auditions? Have we started? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're so seamless. Uh, yeah. Um, do I get nervous for auditions? Y- yes, much, much less so. It it has to do with you know if you get into a rhythm of you know you've been auditioning and then you take one energy uh, one one sort of audition into another, you get very accustomed to that level of adrenaline. And it's, uh, it, it's sort of great when you haven't done it, you know, say, you know, as, as happens for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, mm-hmm. when you go in, uh, it, you, you can't feel, you think, Oh, what is that? What is that? And you realize, of course, it's, uh, it's a little bit of uh, nervousness. And in that case, you welcome it. It, it, it. To me, it's, Oh, I still really care. That's mm-hmm. good. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So that's the sort of the way I treat it. But uh, yeah, I don't think that ever goes away on some level. And it also is a strange sort of thing. Sometimes it's better to audition anonymously because there is no expectation. You know, you can spend a lot of time as an actor, uh, as uh, <laughs> it was so wonderfully described one time, is trying to be as good as you never were. Mm. You know, so it's. It's good to have to audition. The other thing I love about auditioning is, uh, you know, I right now, uh, you know, I'll get some offers and then I'll have some auditions and I'll get some offers if I'm lucky and I have some auditions. I'm very grateful for the offers. And it uh, it means, you know, you're sort of climbing a ladder of sorts. Right. But I, I also get sort of oddly uncomfortable because I'm thinking, well, what do they want? Mm. You know, what part of me do they want? You know, whereas if you've gone in and done an audition and been hired, you know, sort of somewhat, you know, in, in what key the role is in or something, you know, sure. whereas, you know, if you've just been offered the role, you walk in and, you know, so it's, uh, it's sort of uh, an interesting dilemma. Well, that actually r- relates to something, you know, when, when as, I'm, as I'm doing research and, and, you know, what I know about you, Tony, is I think there, at least for me, you have this perception of being a very serious guy. Look at you, like just a very quick glance, like, okay, Tony, Tony's a serious person. And, you know, uh, I was curious because you were talking about, you know, what, what part of you do these people want? Do you think you are a very serious person? Uh, I probably lean more seriously. Mm-hmm. But that said, uh, you know, there's also a real cut up in a, a very silly person. Of course. Uh, in the, a person who's capable of being quite silly and, you know. And what's interesting, uh, and people who know me well, obviously, my loved ones and, you know, my good friends, they never get to see that part on screen. It's very, (laughs) very seldom. And was that something you had to kind of wrestle with, like that you felt like there was a certain expectation based on how you look in terms of embracing that perception? Or were you playing against it for a while? I was just curious about that. Well, you know, I think it's a good question. You, You have to be aware of it. You know, you have to... You know, I had a, a teacher used to say, take a good look in the mirror and know, know what you're casting is, know sort of where you belong. And that said, particularly, you know, this is to, you know, young actors and, and, and people who are trying to break into the business. You know, you use you knock on that door mm-hmm. and realize that's the way people see you while that's going on. And that could be for five years, 10 years or 30 years in the back room of the store the front room being their perception of you, and the back room of the store, you're, you're working on your dreams because you know you are more than that. And, and then things change. You know, when I first started, obviously, I played, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, drug dealers and heavies and, and 
those types of things. And then, you know, you get a little bit older and then you're playing drug dealers with money, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then eventually, you know, you can, I was doing two things at the same time up in Vancouver a couple of years ago. I was uh, recurring on once upon a time mm-hmm. as Geppetto. Now, <laughs> right. <laughs> this is not, uh, this is not a, a, a dangerous man. Of course. Right. You know what I mean? And at the same time, I was in one of the regulars in the first season of a series called Continuum where I was playing a very uh, ends justify the means type of guy, quite sure. quite a dark, mysterious guy. And it, that's heaven for an actor. And, you know, and then you, you start thinking, I always think of what organ a character leads from. And, and hmm. this is probably the best example. I mean, obviously, Geppetto leads from his heart. Everything is about his relationship to, to the boy you know, to uh, to Pinocchio. And because, you know, uh, that series was not about the uh, story that you know of Pinocchio and Geppetto. It was about, you know, the beginnings and the ends, you know, where that, uh, the prequels and the sequels to a fairy tale. There was a lot of room uh, in that to try and figure out who this guy was. Meantime, in Continuum, I'm a uh, sort of, I don't know, a, a very gray character, sort of a... Uh, Lenin-like, who uh, who's capable of great violence mm-hmm. for uh, what he thinks is a good cause, and so the and these so this guy is operating from his mind, and he's operating from a sense of right that is very hard, and very steel-like, unlike Jupiter, mm, you know, true. who's operating instinctively. So you know those those types of things can happen as you get older because there's a. Um, you know, we're, we all have different, it's like a prism, it's like a crystal, you know, prisms and, and different facets. Uh, and I remember when I was early, I, I knew there was something like that going on. When I first, I auditioned for True Romance. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that film, Tony yeah. Scott. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I, I was auditioning for one of the hit guys who was going to, you know, kill somebody. And I did the audition. And it went reasonably well. And he had me do it again. And then he said to me, you know, kid, he said, good audition. He said, but, you know, I need a pure color in this role. I need, you know, someone who I'm going to believe is going to, you know, do great harm to this individual. And when I look at you, I get that. But I also get someone who might give him a hug. I get someone who might actually, you know, back off it. Right. You know, I get someone who might, after he knocked him to the ground, actually sort of help him out before mm-hmm. he knocked him to the ground. And his point was, that would be great if this were a bigger role. Right. If this were a, he says, but this is a one scene, you're in and out, I need, I need a, uh, a much truer color. And he had me do it again, but, and he, he just saw something in my eyes, is what he said. And, uh, and I thought, I've thought about that over the years, and, um, and I, it always makes me, it makes me sort of understand casting in a different way and, and sort of being in the director's chair, you know, and I've done some stage directing, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to understand it's not always the actor's fault. I mean, in actors, we, we generally assume it's something we've done and, and, and casting. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a friend one time who did an audition. It was uh, on hold for a couple of months and then he got the job. He panicked. Because he thought, well, what do they want? Just very much like I was talking about earlier. Sure, he'd yeah. forgotten what he'd done. Oh, okay. So he, he called his agent. The agent called the casting person and, the, and crazy actors. And they said, well, we have the tape. Come on in and watch your performance. So he did. He went in. He watched his... Uh, and he thought, oh, 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 I get it now. Okay, I remember. And then he said, well, while I'm here, why not watch the other people? He thought, oh, you know, mischievously. All the people <laughs> that I was better than. Sure enough, the first guy, oh, oh, no, no, not very good. Then his audition. And then the next guy, he thought, wow, no, that, that guy's really good. And the next guy was really sort of good, different, but good. And the next one. And the next one, not so good. In, you know, and it went on. So there were about eight people that he felt, you know, <laughs> were excellent choices. He did the job. And he's leaving the, uh, on the final day, and he sees the director. And he says, hey, you know, I have to ask you this, just out of curiosity. I went in, I saw, I happened to see the tapes because there was such a hiatus between the audition and the, and, and the shoot. He says, well, why did you cast me? And the director laughed. And the director said, well, it's because you remind me of my Uncle Charlie. <laughs> so now, you have to understand, we go home, and right. our weekend is spoiled. And yeah. we think about it for weeks afterwards as if there was something we could have done in the room. Right. 
you know, differently as opposed to doing the best we can. <laughs> and you just you know? didn't look like Uncle Charlie. That was it. Yes. That's why he got the part. That was the <laughs> difference between him and the other seven actors who were right. equally good. <laughs> well, OK, so let let me I want to talk about, you know, some of the genesis of that, uh, you know, maybe that vulnerability or, or how else we might want to term it, that look that the director saw. I want to take us back to you started in Connecticut. That's where you grew up, correct? Mm hmm. And so what, what did your parents do? Oh, you know, my dad was a, uh, a construction worker uh, back when it was non-union. And my mom was a, um, well, she worked in a uh, sweatshop, essentially. It was a bathing really? suit factory, you know. Wow. Yeah, she, put, you know, did piecework with bathing suits, putting it together. It was hard work. And, you know, and, you know, my dad lucked out probably at 50. He, he was able to get into uh, the post office as a, um, what would they call it, a mail hauler. He, he didn't deliver the mail, but back, they didn't have conveyor belts. And he used to have to unload the trucks, the big sacks of mail. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he did that. And uh, and so that was, and I had two brothers and... Uh, it was a, it was a very, um, you know, blue collar, you know, really blue collar background. Yeah. And were you, were you into, I mean, well, I mean, there's a number of questions here, but what, what do you feel like you picked up from the manual labor that your, your parents were doing? I mean, that, you know, that was their profession. And what do you feel like that instilled in you? Well, you know, it goes, it goes deeper than that because they, they were both working Everyone worked in the household. I mean, from the time I was eight, hmm. I, I had a paper route and, uh, you know, and it was downtown New Haven. You know, that it was a different time. Now you right. can never do that. <laughs> but, and, you know, I realized it was a kind of daycare. Okay. It was a kind of way of knowing where we were because there was a, of course. there was a three hour thing where my mom wouldn't get home from work until five or six. And my dad went to work about three thirty. Because he was, he would work three thirty to eleven thirty or twelve. Uh, so there was a little gap there. So we always worked, but that that paycheck, that uh, you know, newspaper, that money went into the family pot. Right. You know, we could keep our tips, and you know, by no means were we you know mistreated or anything. I'm not mm -hmm, suggesting mm -hmm. that. But what we learned from it is, you learn that you, if you want something, you have to work for it. Right. If you truly, I mean, my parents never really, uh, anytime I wanted something when I was, a, you know, when I finally got around to wanting a car, sure, you'd like a car, work harder, put the money aside, and, uh, you know, we'll sign a loan or whatever you need, And but it, it is your responsibility. And, you know, that is so uh, <laughs> unlike child rearing today because of, you know, in my life, I've sort of discovered that the lessons that the parents learn by their life are generally more often than not they're sort of uh, the complete opposite of what the kids want <laughs> want to do but mm -hmm. the hard work lesson was true so for instance you know parents of the depression teach their kids about frugality and thrift and savings and of course you know i was growing up in the 60s that was not I mean, that was the boom right you know right. so you 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 listen to that and it, it, they taught me those lessons, and I certainly, you know, treated my own life that way, that I didn't expect anyone to uh, really do anything for me. And I was always pleasantly surprised when many people did. So, mm. <laughs> Well, so where did the, uh, the germ of uh, acting or performance uh, start? Was it in, you know, grade school or high school or something like that? No, you know, it, it, I was sort of lost. Uh, a little bit in high school. Uh, you know, I, I was into sports when I was young, so okay. uh, which was really wonderful. I played a lot of basketball through uh, the first couple of years in high school. And it was really, really sort of invaluable to movement when I became an actor. Who knew, right? Mm. That kind of street, uh, you know, j uh, basketball being a very jazz-like, almost modern dance as opposed to, you know, football and baseball, which are, I, I feel, much more regimented, you know? Mm-hmm. So when that sort of stopped, I, when I was in high school, I got a full-time job. There it is. You know, I was working, going to high school and then working three, uh, well, 3.30 to 11.30 at a garage, you know, beneath a hotel. And uh, there used to be a guy that came out from there. And to make a long story short, he was sort of, it was the days of salons were just coming in um, and stuff. And uh, I'd had an experience of uh, with one of these guys of, I was a bust about 10 or 11 of being made up as a werewolf, 
believe it or not. Okay. You know, and it was Halloween. And I was a little kid because some, it's sort of, you, you don't need this for the rest of it. Anyway, they sent me out <laughs> into the world and it was a professional job. He was a professional guy. So I always thought, oh, I'm going to be a makeup artist. I know, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. Well, I had no artistic talent really whatsoever. I'm not. I think for that kind of profession, you need that. So eventually what I ended up doing was, uh, you know, going to high school and I had sort of more of an interest to it. And then uh, I was the first one to go to college. I sort of went decided to go to college late in my senior year. And I happened to literally walk into an audition. It was a state school, a teacher's college, which meant that at the time there were a lot more women. Mm-hmm. So uh, I happened to walk in and they needed uh, men. You know, it was a school where there were probably four women for every every man. And so that's how it uh, really started. Initially, it was social. It was, uh, it was a, a place to put your passion. And coincidentally, because it was New Haven, when I understood this and thought, oh, well, there are theaters around here. I should go see plays. I could walk to Long Wharf literally within 15 right. minutes. Yeah. Or I could walk to Yale Rep within 15 minutes. Put my ten dollars down. Get a student ticket. There, eight dollars. And guess what? I just saw Christopher Walken do Caligula. Right. I didn't know who Christopher Walken was. Sure. I just saw John Cazale do The Contractor. I saw John Lithgow do The Changing Room. So those uh, mm. those were all sort of my initial contacts with theater. It wasn't in you know sort of High School Musicals or those types of things. And, and, you know, initially it was about, it was social. It was about uh, having a tribe and meeting women. And then only, you know, maybe after three years that I thought, you know, oh, you mean there's a life for this? And, and I had some teachers who encouraged me. And, um, and it was, I mean, I'm the un, most unlikely sort of actor of, <laughs> that I can think of in terms of, of when you think of, of who actors are sometimes, you know, but we come from so many different places. Is, is it because of, and I was just, just about to ask, I mean, because of the kind of the blue collar, you know, manual labor yeah. background and, and, and yeah, how did you, so how did your parents feel about you pursuing this acting lifestyle? They weren't happy about it in the, <laughs> because I've always, because I've always, uh, again, you maintain once you get to be a certain age, a certain kind of financial freedom. Now, there's a huge safety net there, you know, if anything had happened to me or any of those things. But because I didn't get in trouble, you know, that was always a big thing. Don't get arrested. And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of my friends did get arrested. So oh, just wow. don't get arrested. Don't don't bring shame and those types of things. So if your dad, that, if your dad knew the Polonius speech, he probably would have been saying it to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> But I'm, I have to tell you one funny story because uh, the first play I did was Shakespeare, right? I was The Tempest. Oh, okay. And the first line I ever said, it was a small role as a mariner. All is lost to prayers, to prayers. All is lost. It's at the beginning of the play. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I would often think about that, that, those lines when I was sort of, you know, coming up and you're struggling and stuff. But the other interesting quick thing, when I was in high school, I saw my first Shakespeare. And it wasn't uh, live. It was from the National Theater. It was a fellow with a Lawrence Olivier. Olivier, and sure, yeah. Lee, right? Well, here's, here's what the funny part of this story is, at least to me. You know, I've done probably 25 of the plays now. But my buddy Frank and I, we sort of, you know, being sort of, you know, kids, high school kids, blue-collar kids, we sort of looked at the screen and thought, eh, well, it's sort of interesting. But, you know, when the intermission, we took off. <laughs> we <laughs> left. So anytime I'm doing a show and audience leaves at intermission, I always think back on myself as being one of those people. And, and I always feel like I'm, you know, I'm being paid back for my rudeness or my insensitivity. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you start doing the shows in, in college and you get this exposure to, you know, some great theater, certainly in the area. And you decide to pursue an MFA. So what was, what was it you felt like you needed with, with that decision? Well, you know, if I needed I, further training because, mm-hmm. you know, it was a liberal arts school. Although I got to work, I probably, you know, did at least four plays a year when I was in school. Okay. Uh, yeah. I still realized that I needed, I needed to work. And, and probably most importantly, a passion was, was sort of ignited. I all of a sudden became a, a, a much more curious person, I, uh, a much better student, because all of a sudden, you know, English literature meant something to me. History meant something. 
a psychology meant something. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, it was a kind of, um, I realized how big the world was. And, you know, and sort of that training did that to me. And uh, and realized I was n- nowhere near ready to uh, to really uh, go out to New York or any of those things. So I decided to get an MFA, which was really uh, really a good choice on my part. Uh, you know, in hindsight. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, I asked some of the listeners for questions, and, and one of the listeners, James, was curious how much you felt the MFA prepared you for the industry. You know, the the business of acting, so to speak, and and how much you rely still on your training from those days? Well, okay, you know, that's an excellent question. Prepares you somewhat, but it, it, it just... Now, we need to separate television and film from... Of course, theater. sure. You're asking sure. me what it prepared me in terms of theater. It did prepare me. It gave me a much wider range and the tools, both physically and vocally, to fulfill the material I was being asked to work on. In terms of television and film, not so much, you right. know? I was blessed in that when I graduated, A, I had very little debt because I was on a full scholarship and I got a fellowship. I I was really sort of encouraged. And so I was able to go to Ashland, which was my first job. Right. Yeah. So as opposed to, yeah, as opposed to being plopped down in New York or LA and you've just done your checkoff project or your, uh, your (laughs) Elizabethan language project. And someone says, here, read this. And, mm-hmm. and thinking, well, you know, you haven't prepared me for that. You know, I, I was doing the stuff I was prepared for. I would, that I had trained for. I was doing. I got a chance to do, obviously, Shakespeare, Machiavelli, Ibsen, uh, Strindberg. And you were the, you were at Oregon for a few seasons, right? I was there in seventy eight and seventy nine as an actor, and then eighty five as a director. Okay. At that time, were they still doing ten month seasons? Was it you know all those plays and rep? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that must have been an education that. in and of itself, just doing that much theater. Yeah. You know, almost year exactly. round. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it really, really was. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you're, you're in a cocoon in school and all of a sudden I'm on the West Coast and there is a, a, a West Coast style. I think, a, you know, at the time I would say on some levels, the, um, you know, the West Coast actors were uh, a little bit crazier. Oh, okay. kind of way, a little bit more. Uh, whereas the, you know, I'm talking about the league school, the Juilliards, the uh, mm-hmm. Yale, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Temple. You know, they, you you could say maybe we were a hair better trained. Now I'm talking. What am I talking about? I'm talking about over <laughs> 40 years ago. So I don't. I, <laughs> I'm not saying that one one uh, coast is better than the other. We of were course. just different. Right. Yeah. And it was so great to sort of all of a sudden. Uh, Test yourself against, you know, other, uh, other different methods, and, different approaches. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know you actually after your MFA, you went and you taught a class called stage speaking back at your undergrad, Southern Connecticut State University. So I, I'm curious, you know, so stage speaking has a very kind of, you know, broad sense. And I'm curious, what was the class and what were you hoping to impart uh, to these students? Well, it, you know, basically it was uh it was voice, and I had just I had graduated uh, from Temple, mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, was uh, sort of flat broke, no prospects, no nothing, and I got uh, two job offers. One is was to team teach at Temple with a, a teacher of mine uh, because he couldn't make it uh, uh, several days, and the other one was to uh, go back to New Haven and teach some classes there. And so I, that's what I did. And the goal was always to get a sort of nest egg so I could move to New York and further my career. And uh, the voice class I treated uh, had been going on. We worked on Shakespeare. We worked on, on other things. And I also taught acting and uh, oh, a bunch of different. Uh, so so you, you, you're doing, you know, I would do exercises from Uta Hagen. Or uh, I would do, I also had some sort of um, exercises from my own grad school that were psychophysical in, in mm-hmm. the sense that they were done on mats and they involved, it involved Shakespearean text. So, you know, I was sort of young and full of it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the time. And, uh, you know, almost to the point where I remember a, an old professor of mine in New Haven said, you know, the students really, really like you. They don't understand the thing you're saying, but they really like you. <laughs> and uh, but 
the biggest thing, uh, you know, all my teachers are so wonderful and they were trying so much to help me make the transition. And so much so that I, I, there was a trap there, which was I was asked to, uh, to continue teaching. Sure, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a wonderful sort of uh, cushion and a great thing. But I felt that I didn't have enough professional experience to warrant teaching, uh, particularly on Temple on the graduate level. Mm. You know, that you needed to go out and, and really test yourself. And that's why I, I remember saying saying no and coming home at night thinking, oh, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Right. But uh, but I'm just going to move to New York. And, uh, you know, and I was in New York a couple of months when uh, Ashland called. And uh, and Ashland was just came from an audition or uh, open call? Well, yeah, Ashland, you know, Ashland, to me, is directly responsible for about mm, 15 years of work. Wow. If I okay. look back to it, because uh, I had done the Erta auditions. I, don't, I think that still exists. U- University Resident Theater Association. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I had done it, and uh, and I remember meeting Bill Patton, who uh, who was the business manager for Ashland at the time, and he said, "Well, we want to offer you a job," and this would have been for the summer of '77. Okay. And I said, "Well, I can't because you you start in April." And I'm I'm doing my final project at school, and I and I remember him looking at me, and sort of there was just a peculiar smile that I never quite understood. <laughs> and it was only later that I realized because when they did call me, it was for the following year. Oh, okay. So in other words, it, it carried over because anyone on the West Coast drops everything, mm. or anyone who knows anything about Ashland, right. you drop everything and you go because it is that kind of wonderful finishing school and that kind of wonderful experience. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm doing six characters in search of an author. And uh, no, I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't leave now. And I didn't even mention it to my teachers. (laughs) Wow. Who (laughs) who probably would have said, Tony, get the hell out of here. Go to Ashland. Absolutely. They would have said. And, you know, and had I gone too early, I maybe wouldn't have gotten the right casting, which I Mm -hmm. did when I got there. Okay. Which led to, you know, uh, 10, 12 years of Berkeley Rep. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I know you did a lot of uh, regional theater uh, and, and maybe it was before you, you landed at Berkeley Rep, but was it just, w- w- was it a form of networking or just starting to meet the right, like how did, you know, cause you were bouncing around from Williamstown and, and yeah, I'm just curious how that all came about. Well, you know, it, it was a different time. There were, uh, right, you know, back then there were sort of communities built around regional theaters that you could have a life. Mm-hmm. That, in right. other words, you didn't have to uh, be an itinerant arts worker, if you will. For like, uh, you know, uh, you could you could be in Milwaukee, you could be in Chicago, you could be in New Haven, you could be at Ashland, Seattle. So basically, w- what happened with me is I always followed the work. I had no dream of spending, you know, the last almost forty years on the West Coast. That was mm-hmm. never in the plan. I thought I'd be in New York, okay. but because I got hired at Ashland for a couple of years, and after that. Basically, the guy who was running it, uh, uh, Jerry Turner, I didn't have my equity card at the time. He said, you know what, uh, you, you really need to go get your equity card because I look to my right, I look to my left, and I'm playing leads with these guys, you know. So he's saying, it's time. So, yeah. you know, I, I went to Seattle. I did, a again, a proactive sort of trip. I don't know where I got, but I went to, from Ashland, I went down to San Francisco to uh, oh, uh, Santa Maria, then I went to Seattle, then I went to Louisville, then I went to Minneapolis. I went to all of these various regional theaters and auditioned for them. Mm. And I got two jobs, one in Seattle and one in Minneapolis. I took the Seattle job simply because I knew more people who lived there. And, okay. uh, and uh, you know, and I sort of did that for a year. And uh, while I was at Ashland, I met uh, Michael Leibert, who ran Berkeley Rep. Uh, I was in a play about Strindberg, playing the Strindberg characters, uh, <laughs> and it was a, quite a funny play. And uh, he he really liked it. We had breakfast. He says, I'm expanding my company. We're building a new theater. I want you to come, and it's going to be a five-year commitment. Wow. And I remember laughing at him, thinking, oh, oh. You know, he said, no, no, no. If we don't like each other, we don't enjoy working with each other. We'll shake hands and uh, and carry on. But I, I want to know that you're committed. And I said, oh, sure. So. In 1980, I uh, moved to Berkeley, and I was there pretty much for 10 years, you know, at Berkeley Rep as a director and an actor. So, um, 
That was, I mean, you know, that was so lucky. You know? Yeah, obviously, it's a combination of you know the the work you've been doing and uh, you know right place, right time, of course, and all that. And but one of the things I, I am curious about is you know a sense of actors can have a real challenge with having confidence in themselves and their abilities. And I'm curious, you know, certainly, you know, here you you get to work at Ashland and you're doing these leads, even as a non-equity actor. Where did that sense of confidence in your ability either come? Was it the MFA or was it just actually doing the work uh, or did you ever struggle with that? No, certainly you struggle with it. I think I think any, uh, you know, uh, I I think generally it's the bad actors who don't struggle with it. OK, if that makes sense. I think, yes, they have yeah, too much. Yeah. you know, we all know those guys. Or those gals, you know, they come in and, but uh, no, certainly I struggled with it. And the MFA helped enormously, but it is just simply doing it, just simply doing it. I, I used to have a, a wonderful acting teacher who used to say, you have to stamp your own passport in this business. Hmm. That if, you, if, if you're an actor with passport in hand, waiting for some country to let you in, thinking that you're not an actor until you get that stamp, it's pretty miserable life. But, you know, occasionally you can stamp your own passport and say, I've done the work. I'm ready. You may not hire me, but I'm ready. Right. Uh, and somebody else will. Because, you know, it's, but, but confidence comes and goes. We've all experienced that, particularly on the, uh, you know, on the stage, particularly on the stage in long runs, you know, you, uh, you all of a sudden, uh, you know, you go up one night. And what's frightening then is not stepping off stage. What's frightening is coming to that place again because your mind sort of races ahead. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you realize, hey, you know what? Everybody goes up. And, you know, in, from what used to be the most humiliating thing you can ever imagine, you develop a kind of hardening that protects that sensitive part of you and said, you know what? Yes, I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. but that's not all I am. Right. I'm also the other 999 times when I went on and did reasonably well. You know what I mean? Uh, so, but confidence uh, is, and particularly in film and television, oh my God, film and television is, it's, uh, but you know, the training helped. The other thing I think that may have helped me is uh, I was always a character guy. I mean, I'm curious where you were going with the film and television confidence. Well, the film and television, I was go going with it because, uh, I I didn't really get involved. I didn't come to L.A. until I was almost 40. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and that was a wise thing for me. I was not selling youth. I was <laughs> not. And, and, and I use the word selling in possibly the most crass sense, because anyone who comes to L.A. who doesn't think they have a for sale sign out. <laughs> right. <laughs> you wonder, right, well, what do you come to L.A. for? Right. You know, stay wherever you are. Do do your art. But somewhere along the line, art and commerce have to meet right. for an actor. And, and whether that's to provide uh, for your family, for your future security, uh, for whatever reason, uh, whether it has to be about testing yourself in a much, in, you know, you've been working in maybe a lake. And now, I mean, <laughs> now you're in a serious ocean, you know, and, and just testing yourself particularly. Right. You know, in this day and age, you know, we're in the 21st century, you know, the separation between um, this sort of preciousness about theatrical acting versus film acting, I think, is a foolish, foolish argument. Mm, OK, got it. Got it. Of course, people will always ask, which do you prefer? Of course, you prefer theatrical. Mm -hmm. The reason you prefer it, at least the reason I do, is because I get to play the symphony, the whole, the whole thing, the whole night myself. I get to choose a director, a playwright, a producer. Anyone could come up to me and say, Tony, you know, in that third scene, you really need to, you need to up it. You need to goose it. We need to move through that. And then I'm a participant. Right. I then can say, and hopefully I, you know, I'd say, you know, I, I may disagree with you, but I'm going to try it tonight. I'm going to go for it tonight because, you know. But I am a, a participant and a primary artist in that. Whereas in film and television, you know, you, it's, it's done in the editing room. You, you are not creating the music of the script. Right. And the reason you're there or not there may often have nothing to do with your performance. Yes. And I, I mean, they could be using just the editing, the pacing, the music, all, all these lighting, all these things that, uh, you know, are, the, are not about your performance uh, to tell the story. Or star power. If, yeah, sure. if, you're, yeah. if you are doing a scene 
with a, an Academy Award winner, and they have paid them an enormous amount of money to be in the scene with you, you can be guaranteed that when they make those choices in editing, they're going to favor that person. That is good right. business. That's right. who the audience has come to see. Of course. If you're on the stage, if I'm on stage with an Academy Award winner, the audience does the editing. They can right. choose to watch he or she or watch me. They mm -hmm. do the close-up. And that's a, a really wonderful distinction. So in a kind of way, it's much more democratic. You have to bring it every night. Right, right, right. So was that something that you developed as an actor when you were at Berkeley in terms of what you prefer about the stage? Or, or I'm just curious, how did you develop as an actor uh, with your work at Berkeley Rep? Well, yeah, that's, a, that's a, an excellent question. The Berkeley Rep provided me, again, a home for 10 years, a stable place to be, to live and work as an artist. I wasn't all over the country. I was pretty much there. It challenged me. I did everything from Brecht to Mamet to Shakespeare to, oh, Tennessee Williams to uh, Eduardo Di Filippo to, uh, I mean, uh, Christopher Hampton. You know, you, you were mm -hmm. doing everything, and you weren't always good at everything. But you sort of had to, if you will, there was a fascination of the audience coming and see, seeing people in a variety of roles. So oddly, the same kind of star system is created naturally within a company by an, by an audience feeling like the actor, they have an investment in the actor. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there was that kind of um, challenge, if you will. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know me, and you know... Uh, what I look like. Mm -hmm. uh, my second or third year there, Michael Leibert, a dear friend who's, who's passed away, but who brought me into the company, brought me into his office and told me my casting for the year. And the second thing he told me I was going to be playing was the gentleman caller in Glass Menagerie. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I ask you. <laughs> Nathan? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I ask you. Now, if I, was in a, if I was in a marketplace, if yep. this were a marketplace... This is not going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is not going to happen. But I had to figure out a way to bring this. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's one of, when I think about it now, it's one of the most satisfying things I ever did. Hmm. Talk about fear. I remember right. being petrified at the read-through. when we were, I said, I don't know what. I'm going, he must, but, you know, he had such faith in me. I, I felt foolish not to have faith in myself. But mm. I, I kept looking. Is there a mistake? And back then, people, you know, smoking was common. Uh, you know, most <laughs> many actors smoked. There was a pack of cigarettes and there was a, a book of matches. And on the book of matches was exactly what the gentleman caller is about. It's one of those correspondence course for uh, radio and okay. stuff. It was right. And I'm thinking to myself, there it is. This is it. This, this is Jim. This is Jim's future. It's a matchbook. Hmm. You know, and somehow that led me in and made me uh, create uh, things that I've never seen in The Gentleman Caller. Like, uh, you know, I, I really got into learning how to do shadow puppets that were uh, shadow animals with your hands. OK. And that's how I entertained Laura. So you're saying you envisioned Jim as the kind of person who would be doing these correspondence courses? Right. OK. I, this, this was he, he was Jim was not is not a person of substance, I don't think, in that play. Okay. Yeah. I think he's a failure. He's he's talking as if he's not. Sure. Right. Right. He's but, not. A, you know. He's he's probably. You, you know. He was the football guy, the sports right. guy. But now he's out of school. It's like the Bruce Springsteen's uh, song, you know, where he talks about uh, sports heroes. And anyway, so and it's interesting what a road, this sort of, that sort of path has helped me enormously when I've had to be charming or be. Uh, vulnerable or be uh, any of those things, uh, you know, having that experience. If you come right to L.A. or you, you went right into North, you may not have had the time to have that experience. Right. If they had gone to New York to cast, they would have found a better gentleman caller physically, mm -hmm. perhaps, certainly physically, perhaps, than me. But forcing me to do that is what sort of the forces an actor into growth in a kind of way, that kind of fear. and occasionally. Uh, Failure, you know, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. There is uh, failure involved, but it's all. Um, Herbert Berghoff said um, it takes a lot of manure to make a rose, <laughs> right? And that's true for the actor. And what, which leads to the next part of the story, which is why I 
decided to come to L.A., and in part it was because the aesthetic was changing. All of a sudden, you know, companies were getting, in fact, cut back financially. There were financial issues. And that was happening all over. Um, and so I, I thought, well, you know what? It's time. I, I, I mean, I could have stayed on, but I thought, mm, I'm almost 40. If I want to taste film and television, now is the time. And so I just sort of took a, a leap. Uh, Dakin Matthews was down here already. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I had a couple of Hope Alexander Willis was down here. And so, you know, I sort of negotiated it. I'm happy I did. And so, you know, in the, you know, in those first couple of shows that you were doing, you know, you had, there were some name shows like LA Law and Columbo. What do you feel like you were taking away in terms of watching the regulars on that show? Because here you are in a new medium, new style, so to speak. What do you feel like you were learning from that? Well, you know, you're just getting your sea legs. Okay. Pretty much. You know, the first, the first job I, I was hired, the first day of film in LA was on LA Law. Mm-hmm. Which wow. is uh, which is sort of a wonderful place to yeah. start, yeah. You know, and uh, I remember going to the audition. It was a uh, a barkeep okay. in a biker bar, and when I arrived at the audition, I thought, you know, I mean, he was a little scraggly. I had a beard at the time, and you know, I, I was feeling significantly, uh, you know, scraggly and stuff. But and but there was nothing but bikers at the audition. Hmm. I mean, these guys, two hundred and forty, two hundred sixty pounds tattoos all over and i'm thinking what am i doing <laughs> right. what am i doing here but i got you know go figure i got i got the part and uh i think it's just at that point it's hope it's hoping no one will call you out mm-hmm. you know we all have a fear that someone's going to say hey wait a minute stop right Hold on. the imposter you, syndrome pointing yeah. at you you the exactly. actor you don't know what you're doing isn't that right right and you'd have to say i'm sorry sir but you're absolutely correct <laughs> i don't <laughs> But you, you know, you weather it and you learn, you watch. Uh, the director was very kind, the Columbo director in particular, which happened to be Sean Penn's dad, oh, okay. Leo Penn, who was a marvelous actor. And I did the audition for him and he was real good. I remember feeling pretty good about it. It was a long eulogy audition. And then uh, the day came and all of a sudden, you know, it's, uh, it's a little nerve wracking. Got a lot of text, I'm new and he. I did it a couple of times, and it was it was just a little stiff. It wasn't right. And he he says, "Hey kid, hey kid, come over here. Just just take it easy, take a deep breath. You're here. You're supposed to be here. You're here. Now just just go nice and easy, nice and easy." And he was so kind. And so I sort of you know, as opposed to many directors who are like, "Oh my God, they're looking at their watch, thinking, right. oh my God, what am I going to do?'" Uh, he was so great. And, uh, and of course the other lesson is it was a eulogy, as I said. So it was like a three minute speech or something. Right. right wow. When I saw it, the camera was only on me for probably about 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you, you learn because it's a eulogy. They're, they're sort of picking up everyone, uh, you know, all the potential suspects for the murder, you know? Right, and, right, right. That's pretty funny. But again, sea legs, okay. sea legs okay. is what it's about. And, and, you know, I mean, a lot of times for actors, especially when they go to a new market, um, it can be hard or the hardest thing can can just be to get noticed or to be, you know, to put yourself on, on people's radars. Did you come into town with an agent or, or how did that start? No, no. I came into town and uh, I just went around. That was back in the day where you could actually drop off a picture. Now they... Everything is done electronically. But what happened, what saved me was, uh, you know, I'd go see, um, Dagan was doing a sitcom at the time. So, I, you know, I'd go to a screening and learn. And then he said, I have a, I have a friend who's in a play. You should go see it. It's an interesting play. So I did. It was called Tamara. And uh, uh, Kathy McGrath was his friend. And uh, we went for drinks afterwards. And the next day, I had an audition for this play. Hmm. Because they were replacing someone. Okay. And so I got that job. And that was, it gave me a place to be at night. It gave me a a community. And it gave me some exposure. I then worked through the whole thing with my agent. Trying to, you know, uh, it's very hard to get an agent. Uh, I finally have since discovered the thing I always tell people is, don't ask, if you're a male, don't ask males. Don't ask people of your own type, I guess is what I mean. Mm-hmm, ask mm-hmm. a female or ask an older guy or a young kid, someone that you're not in competition with. Right. Or you, there's no way you could be in competition with. 
So you, you mean in terms of uh, asking for referrals and things like things of yeah. that nature? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I mean, an actor my types really shouldn't expect me to make a recommendation for him to my agent and vice versa. Sure. You know, I shouldn't certainly shouldn't expect him. Right. Uh, but what ended up happening was it gave me it took me about eight weeks to get an agent. Seven weeks. OK. Which is remarkably quick. Sure. Yeah. And it was it was a good mid level agent, it was, uh, J. Michael Bloom at the time. He handled. Uh, he, he, I was very very lucky. And again, I went in. I met him. I had friends who were with him, and he had me audition for him. Had me audition again, and finally we're sitting in his office, and I realized he asked me. Uh, oh, he was asking me about Berkeley, and I knew his college roommate. Oh God! Wow. You know, just. I mean, you know, I knew him. Sort of as another person in the acting community, I'd never worked with him, right. but I knew who he was, and you know we had chatted, and that's where, why I think <laughs> he took me on, you know. So go figure. Well, I mean, I, I think it's also a good reminder to hear these stories. It's not, you know, while some people, and not in this case, but you know, some people are always complaining about whether it's nepotism or friends or whatever. I think there's also something when he said about. A lot of times you can't explain it or it's just happenstance or luck or, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it's yeah. it's it's I think so many times we are looking for, well, what's the thing I can do? I can definitely do to get X. And uh, a lot of times it, there is nothing you can do. It just it, you might just be lucky. You might just be the, the guy who looks like Uncle Charlie or, uh, you know, you knew the guy's college roommate. And, and that just that just helped. Absolutely. You know, it is. Uh... It's odd. You know, if you're in the regions, uh, it's more about a kind of range. That's mm-hmm. great. Sure. You know, but I think when you, particularly when you're new in L.A., it's about being being that perfect guy or that perfect gal for the uh, for the job, mm-hmm. if you will, for the look of the job. Right. Uh, they, they're not interested in whether you can also do, you know, the playing Hamlet. You can also do Festy. They, they don't care. Right. You can do Festy. They're looking for Hamlet or vice right, versa. Right, 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 right. So it's about, you know, until you then get opportunity to play different things and then you have that ability, then that's that's useful. But initially, you need to be, uh, again, that true color for them, right. I think. Well, I want to talk about a, a couple of specific stage roles you did. The first one, I want to know, what was it like when you returned to Merchant of Venice? It was about 25 years between first you directed it and then you performed, you were playing Shylock. And what did you learn coming back to the play and in a different position, so to speak, you know, 25 years later? Well, you know, it's a problematic play that is a great, great play in in terms of its balance and in terms of a history that also deals, has a serious notes in it. So Mm -hmm. I learned... I had done an enormous amount of uh, sort of research and reading about it as uh, when I directed it and spoke spoke to a rabbi about even the question of even doing the play should it be done hmm. and and that that was fascinating to me uh, and then uh, you cut to twenty five years later and now Sharon Ott, of course, who directed it, took over Berkeley Rep. So that again is tied into my experience at Berkeley, and we had done uh, a bunch of plays with her in, in Twelfth Night and uh, oh, just a number of plays. And uh, when she wanted to do it, it allowed me to go in just personally. All I had to think about was Shylock. Okay, right. Uh, I, and, you know, I like to, when I, when I direct, I like to think of the entire play as one character, the facets of one character. So, mm. you know, if, which is very different than if you're playing Stanley or Blanche in Streetcar. Your research is different, et cetera. So coming back to Shylock was... Um, such a great role, you know, I mean, of course, it, it's so uh, it's so wonderful. And having worked with uh, Sharon a bit, uh, you know, we developed a, a certain sort of uh, sh- shorthand and she allowed me, she gave me a, a long leash, uh, no trusting that, you know, if she tugged, I would come mm-hmm. back. And, right. uh, and, you know, and uh, it went it went really, really well. And uh, I don't know what else to say except to wish other actors, the uh, fortune of getting a chance to play that role. Uh, several years later, I got, you know, I think it was three or four years later, I went back and uh, did a leer mm-hmm. for her, which was uh, also sort of, you know, much, much, much more difficult. But, uh, right. you know, a uh, a road well, uh, well-traveled, you know, it's a treat to sort of do that, uh, particularly when you're done with it. <laughs> 
Well, I, you know, I remember, yes, yeah. I remember Armin Shimmerman saying, I think he was maybe specifically talking about Shakespeare roles and certainly the larger ones, that it takes like three times to really figure it out, uh, playing it three times. Because every time you go back, and certainly as you get older, you, you're bringing a new understanding to the character and, and you're, under, you're understanding things in a different way. But do you feel like your directing of the play really kind of gave you that edge in terms of playing Shylock? Do you feel like you brought a lot more because of that experience? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would, you know, I, I had brought a sense of the structure of the play and because of knowing what the structure of it is, knowing perhaps a little bit more places to maybe that more exploration can happen. Mm hmm places where all of a sudden we're jumping over something. Wouldn't it be interesting for Shylock to come home and discover that the house has been robbed and Jessica is not there, as opposed to all of a sudden we see him in the next scene, it's already happened. Is right. there a way of, of making that physical on stage uh, is one example. But So it helps enormously. But to your question, I, I have done that really three times. Uh, once with Mercutio, I played it in college and then played it at Colorado Shakes. The second time was with Leontes in Winterstale, which Dakin directed. Hmm. And I played that uh, at Cal Shakes and then played it at Berkeley Rep. And then ultimately, uh, the last one was, and this is wonderful, Iago, which I played at Cal Shakes or Berkeley Shakes, and then played it at ACT. Both, without Armin is absolutely right, particularly with Iago. You know, hmm. uh, I mean, it is such a load and uh and just getting through it the first time right but one of the ways of doing that i think there's a i think we're getting away from it but there's a misconception that somehow actors shouldn't come in having some of their lines learned i think that's i think particularly in the great shakespearean roles you there's so much external text work that you can do right that is about the structure of the of the various speeches that then you could add the acting to when you're in rehearsal, but the text work and all of that, the historic work, the conceptual work, you know, what kind of madness is, you know, is, is, is it dementia? Right, 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 right. I mean, what, what is it? What is it? You know, is it, uh, is it uh, narcissism? Uh, you know, that kind of, those kinds of things, whatever road you want to walk up. The first one, the first Othello Iago, was was done pretty straightforward, you know, Renaissance, mm -hmm. Italy, uh, Richard E.T. White directed. It was quite quite wonderful to do it. And then, But the second one, a guy, Richard Side directed, who's an acting teacher mm -hmm. down here. And he, he's much more process-oriented. And this one, if you will, was almost like it was a film noirish one. And I remember trying to figure out, never, I always felt so rather guilty about some of the treatment of a fellow, you know, yeah, a fellow is too easy a target occasionally. So I never, you know, I didn't want to go there too quickly. I didn't mm -hmm. want it to, because it becomes funny in sure. some way and it sure. mustn't be, uh, I think. So uh, I remember I worked on, on, in class a lot when I got down here and, and this is before the, uh, um, Branna, Lawrence Fishburne, but we did it. I did it with Steve Jones and the whole seduction of Othello, if you will, into this madness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I was playing, I play as Ensign, so we did it as a bath. And this is before the movie came out, mind you. So when I was doing that whole, when, he, when Iago was working on Othello, I, I was shaving his head. Oh, wow. Razor. I mean, so there was a whole, and he was naked in a tub. You know what I mean? In a in yeah, a, yeah. a war situation, a very rustic looking. And so I was pouring water and doing all. So it was much, it flowed much more easier as opposed to, hey, you know, you know what I mean? It, right. It, it was, I think it added, uh, and that was something that came out of my first experience with the play where I thought, okay, I, you know, I want to believe that he believes. Right. I don't want him, to, I, I don't want him just to believe me because the script says he has to believe me. I want to figure out a way of convincing him. You know what I mean? Right. And, and so that's what I struggled with in the, the second time I did it. And it was, uh, it was wonderful. It was actually uh, a wonderful experience. And I could easily do it a third time, except I think I'm a little too old. <laughs> well, they just had, uh, what, James Earl Jones and uh, was it Vanessa Redgrave doing Beatrice and Benedict in London uh, last year or a couple of years ago? So never say never. <laughs> yeah, but before you said Beatrice and Benedict, you said James Earl Jones. But that's this, right, this is right. true. This so is true. that's why. <laughs> this is true.
Yeah. Well, uh, I, I wanted to say you'd be happy to hear uh, Harry Groner when he was on the show. He was so adamant to learn your lines before you get to rehearsal. He was just like, he's oh, like, good. it's one, one of the best things you can do. He said, I've taken, you know, sometimes I'll take a month if I have it to learn an entire play before I get to rehearsal. Um, and he was, he's a huge proponent of just, you know, being off books so that you can really start getting to that secondary level of work that you were talking about. Absolutely. And trust yourself that you will be flexible enough that, you know, if your line is two and the other act, one actor is saying three to you, you will say five. If you're doing the play with someone else and your line is three and an actor says one to you, you will get to four. You're not right. going to force. Of course. You know, I mean, you just have to, you know, and it, it's so funny because Uta Hagen, uh, you know, I, I was sort of, I went to H&B for a while when I was in New York. I was only there for a couple of months. But she was so adamant about not learning lines ever hmm. the first time I heard her speak. And then you cut to 15, 20 years later, she's in L.A., and, and she said exactly the same thing. Wow. She basically said, I was wrong about that. Yeah. It's a good lesson. It's a good lesson. Um, now, the other part that I wanted to ask about was when you played Jaquees in As You Like It with the Antias Company because you were nominated for an ovation award in Los Angeles. And, you know, awards and recognition are kind of a very tricky beast when it comes to acting. And how have you managed your own feelings about awards and recognition? And like most actors, you spend your career not getting awards for every part you play. So what was your internal barometer for if you were doing good work? You know, they're two separate things, the awards and the work. The great thing about the Ovation Award is they're peer awards. You're nominated by uh, other actors and other theater people in the community. It's not about uh, critics. Mm -hmm. So it's about people that have been in the trenches and perhaps know that sometimes uh, there's a little mystery of where performances and where productions come from. You never know if an idea that a review credits a director came actually from the director or from the designer or from another actor. And vice versa, you never know if all of a sudden that moment that you've admired, that, that actor's transformative moment actually came from the director. You, 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 you never know, and you have to hope they balance out. But it is, I mean, it's nice to be recognized, but uh, you're always surprised as an actor. You think, oh, well, I've been nominated. And then you go see a performance, and you think, oh, that person is really wonderful. And then you go see another person has been nominated, and you think, oh, my God, that's dreadful. You realize that you're at the mercy of taste mm -hmm. in a kind of way. So uh, we know, of course, in uh, particularly in uh, in painting, that some of the greatest people we we admired were uh, never recognized in their own life. Right. So you have to uh, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, initially, it's important because you're young and you think it's important. So, what were the what were the guiding principles then that made you feel like you know what? Even if I'm not getting nominated, getting awards, getting recognition, I might feel I deserve. I know I'm doing good work because of, you know, these criteria or these feelings I have. Well, you know, you're in the room with the audience. Okay. So, you know, it's, if you're doing the right kind of work, they will give you feedback. Right. Um, and it's, I don't know, that goes back to stamping your own passport. I'm yeah. doing what I feel this role is about. Uh, I'm not doing it to please other people. I'm, I'm mining this vein in the play of this character uh i'm working with the director i'm working with my other actors uh, uh i'm being uh, i'm being available to them uh i'm challenging them i'm hoping they challenge me there, there are those types of things uh, and those are often unsung you know you never you never know and of course there are always uh, favorites there are people who are who are just simply by their Beyond their talent, their their very sort of essence is just sort of attractive. Mm -hmm. That's that's part of our business too. That's you know in film and television they call it star power. It's just mm -hmm. you know a twinkle. A, a call it whatever you want, and you just frankly, as I look back and I realize that uh, you know I've been doing this for over forty years now and managed to keep employed and to earn my living at it. I realize just how lucky I've been and how fortunate I've been. And that is all the success I need because you have to realize that is probably uh, five to 10% of, of the union. 
Right. That is, it's minuscule. I think where we get into trouble as actors is, again, when we look, for, and it's so hard, we're human. We need, we need to be appreciated. We need those things. But from civilians, meaning family and friends who are not in the profession and don't understand it, they, I realized early on they understand two things about acting and the profession of acting. They understand star and starving. They don't understand a middle-class existence, an existence that has ups, peaks, valleys, successes, failures, but it's a life. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, Nina says at the end of The Seagull, you know, uh, what I discovered is that the most important thing is the ability to endure. Because you never know when it's going to happen. You, you, now, I have no illusions that I'm <laughs> going to become a great star, at, you know, in, in, when I'm in my 70s. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. But th there are other opportunities. There are other... Uh, sort of experiences, and particularly in the theater, not so much now the way plays are being written, but if you think back on Chekhov, uh, certainly in Shakespeare, they're generational plays. In other words, there is, there's the uh, young guy who's not the, uh, the young male lead, he's not the juvenile, but he's, you know, and then you got the juvenile, and then you have you know, the romantic guy, and then you have the leading man, mm -hmm. then you have a character man, and then you have an old man. And the same thing exists for women. So you could age into a profession. Right. What's, ha what's happening now is uh, plays are not written that way mm -hmm. anymore. If you look at television and film, and particularly in the age of diversity and stuff, where you hear so much about that, the next probably big diversity. Uh, is going to be about age. I mean, you know, I can watch television for two weeks and not really see see very few roles I could have even auditioned for, right. let alone. You right. know what I mean? And again, I'm not saying there is a conspiracy against of course, yeah, <laughs> against old people, but I'm saying it is it is what it is. And um, well, yeah, I mean, the market the market shifts and and people's tastes shift, and and uh, you know, the the industry is trying new things and trying different things and. Um, yeah, and yeah, you have to you you have to weather that. You have right. to understand that, not take it personally, all, which is very difficult for an actor because then the next question becomes, well, how else can I take it? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, to, you know, it's not like uh, when we go in as actors and audition for a role, it's not like we're just putting a resume there and and they're responding to our. Uh, a little bit of an interview. There, we're, we're actually putting something in front of them that we've struggled with and we think reflects something. So it's very hard not to take it personally, but you have to learn that lesson. Right, right. So you must take, the, getting back to your original question, the same thing must be true about uh, prizes, about mm -hmm. awards. Sure. Is you have to believe in the theater beyond that. They're all They're all wonderful occasions to party and they can have Financial consequences, particularly when you get into, uh, you know, film and television and, and, you know, theater in New York and, uh, you know, where they can affect your bottom line. But mainly, yeah, I think you, you have to just carry on and, and, and don't believe too much of your reviews either way. Right. Well, actually, I mean, I thought, I thought now might be a good time to jump into the sonnet if that's, if that's cool with you. No, that's great. So you want to talk about sonnet 130. And so, yeah, I would just, you know, love to hear, you know, some of your ideas. I mean, you've done, as you've mentioned, Lear and Shylock and Iago and, you know, lots and lots of Shakespeare. And so I, I would just love to hear some of the ideas that you bring to uh, this text and, you know, this specifically. And I'm sure it's a lot of the same questions that you might bring to, uh, to any text. Yeah, it's a little different. And I thought I'd, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do something Verse wise is because uh, so much of it is is oral. It's about you know it's about listening. Right. So in a kind of way, uh, because you you know the listeners don't have any access to the physicality or to behavior, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is a very important part of acting, I think. And um, but looking at the sonnet, and uh, again, uh, I was, I'm highly influenced by a number of people in terms of working on Shakespeare, but probably the person who I respect most is, uh, is Dakin Matthews. And the reason mm -hmm. is, is because I see both sides of the coin. I see a kind of erudition mm -hmm. and a kind of sensitivity to the text. But I've also, you know, we did Julius Caesar together, so I've been on stage okay. uh, with him. And I see, you know, the great inventiveness 
and craft that he has. So, you know, so often actors will reject, they can reject acting teachers and everything because they think, oh, well, you're not really an actor. You don't really, well, you can't do that with Dagan. Right. <laughs> you know, because, you know, he'll clean your clock, you know what I mean? So anyway, this uh, sonnet, I'll read it first. And, you know, sonnets generally, uh, we tend to think of them as being romantic and everyone. This is the anti-love sonnet. Okay, okay. This is the one that makes fun of sonnets that are too flowery. So, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dun. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white. But no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I, I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. So that's uh, this is a sonnet that sort of makes fun of uh, of love sonnets. If right, you know. of course, yeah. So now the approach to it and is for a, you know a modern actor is is um, simply to look objectively at the words to start, which seems. You know, as actors, we constantly want to act right away. So you look down and you realize, okay, you know, my mistress eyes, the very first, is he talking about his mistress as in what we think about a, a married mm-hmm, man? Mm-hmm. And their mist- No, he's not. He's not. He's talking about his love, his, his lady. He's talking about his girlfriend, you know. And then it continues now. So you keep trying. I guess what I'm saying is you try to analyze to see if there are any words that are sort of at odds or... or or weird. The next one, line four, there's a word done. We don't mm. know. He said, if snow be white, why then her breasts are done. And done is sort of like a, a grayish brown color. Mm-hmm. It's the color of a horse. So he's calling him. You know? Okay, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's a rather insulting of course. Uh, sonnet, initially, you think. I mean, it, it's the kind of sonnet that, you know, I think of it as like, um, you know, guys bragging about, you know, the, the eyes and the beauty and, the, and, 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 you know, the blonde hair and the blue eyes of the lady. And the guy sitting in the corner with the beer says, I've been listening to you guys all night. Let me tell you about my lady. And then we get to a word, damaged, you know, mixed colors. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, we eventually get, it's important, to, it's important to take these things from poetry and make them, concrete to you make them if it's treaty put it in a bar whatever you want you know he's basically saying his his mistress has bad breath on top of everything else right she doesn't have red really lips that are anywhere near like the lips you're talking about you know her breasts are not snow white they're sort of you know sort of brown probably freckled you know yeah, roses are really really beautiful but you know what she's got no color in her cheeks uh and her breath stinks but i will say one thing about her that i really really like I love to hear her speak, but, and then he qualifies it, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. And then all of a sudden it switches. I grant I never saw a goddess go, you're, because you're beautiful. I can't see them. They're all in the air. They're floating. They're these serial sorts of things. My lady happens to be right there in the corner city. She walks upon the ground. And, and then ultimately the beautiful couplet at the end and yet, by heaven, I think my love is rare, as any she belied with false compare. You guys are all liars. There's the real item right there. Mm-hmm. It's sort of what Petruchio would say to Kate, mm-hmm. you know, or something. It's that kind of turn. So, I, you know, I love that. And, you know, my approach would be, okay, now what is the situation appropriate to this? Right. And that, hence, I mean, I always think of it as a, as a, I mean, he could be a little drunk. What he's doing. You know, my, mist- my mistress eyes... Well, they're nothing like the sun. <laughs> you know, I mean, sure. it's, it, it lends itself to a um, a kind of anti-heroic sorts of thing. And yet, 
it is by the end, I think, should be well delivered, and I'm not suggesting I'm delivering it well. It should be, it should tug at your heartstrings. It should, it should be an honest kind of love as opposed to love being all about metaphors and similes. My love is like, uh, my, uh, you know, mistress is this, she, you know, she, her eyes are diamonds, uh, you know, all of that stuff. So there's a payoff for the abuse and it's a lo- I love it because it's sort of a love for a woman for who she is. Mm-hmm. And particularly, I, I think most, if you can do it correctly, you can explain it to a woman who seems to be uh, forced into a, you know, an objectification of beauty that is all about boobs and perfect eyes and everything, and, and, and say, no, I, you know, I happen to love you just like that. Right. Don't change anything. No. Right. And so there's something really, really beautiful about that. You know, as you were saying, it was kind of a comment on other uh, sonnets and, and, you know, probably that other sonnets are talking about um, they're describing a goddess, you know, that their their love is a goddess and their love is so perfect and divine. And 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 what I what I really enjoyed about what you were highlighting is the honesty with which this uh, speaker is communicating that, you know, I think it would be very easy to fall into the trap of of trying to play this for laughs. And 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 yet really understanding that, you know, you can you can comment on this and, and comment on, you know, what you love and, you know, what what isn't great about your uh, your love. But you're not you're not trying to make a joke about it. You're just you're just being truthful about the situation. Um, right. And of course, that's where yeah. the comedy comes. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, if I if I were directing this or I was staging this, I, I would inc- and there were other people, I would encourage the laughter from the other people. Mm -hmm. and then absolute silence when it turns right toward the end. And yet, my heaven, I think my love is rare. That's when he turns it on the other people. Right. And that's what's really fun about this sonnet is that it it has one of those turns. Uh, I mean, maybe most of them do, but but this one really kind of changes in in maybe the direction you think he's going. Right. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it's fascinating. You know, his sonnets are little dramas, as they're always called. You know, right. and uh, you know they're useful to the actor because you can sort of you can hook something onto that and take it into a more uh, dramatic sort of place, for lack of a better word. You know, circumstances, etc. So. Well, and, and I think it's a it's a good micro example of what you can do with the larger characters. That I, I think it's easy to ascribe. Um, you know, whether you're talking about Iago or Lear, you know, how they're supposed to be played or what kinds of characters they are or where they're coming from. Whereas, you know, if you look at the text as objectively as you do a sonnet, it's so open to who is this person? You know, it's just it's this person saying these words. But who is that guy? Who is that girl right. saying these lines? Yeah, you know, you're you're absolutely right. And it's it, you have to ask that question, but it's you know, they could read the play at home. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, I mean, you could read the play at home. So you have to, it's a kind of chemistry between your own personality, your own uh, conceptual ideas, and uh, the material and the character, if you will. And, and there's a kind of, I think Olivia used to talk about finding a, a use the creation of a role as if it were a taut string. And, and on one side, the actor is pulling and on the other side, you know, with behavior and modernity, and, uh, and and on the other side, the playwright, the poetry, the character is pulling. And 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 the trick is is to pull it from both ends so it sort of throbs. Mm. And that's what's exciting on the stage. If it's too behavioral and too modern and has no respect for the text, well, you you lose you lose the thought, you lose the uh, the idea of the sonnet. If it's if it's too formal and too subservient to the text, then it's of no interest. It's a, it's a museum piece. Mm. And the trick is to find that medium. And that's what always changes, if you will. And that's why the plays continue. Uh, there's never, there will never be uh, the definitive production or performance of any role except for the period it's in. Right. Now, so you can't have a Lear of a generation, absolutely. But a Lear for all time? I don't think so. Because was the play dead? Sure. You know, no, it's going to, it's going to, or Juliet, et cetera. You know, these plays, 
you know, becking you because they're alive. And, um, and that's, you know, one of the approaches, uh, I try to, uh, I try to take in particular, you know, it, it's very important for these roles because they've been well trod. You know, there's so many different versions of Lear and Hamlet and Juliet and Lady M and Beatrice and everything that you, you really need to allow yourself in, in a kind of way. You need to create a kind of uh, personal relationship with it and uh, allow your personality to occupy a portion of the thing. Now, I, I don't want to say the full, you know, uh, because then you'll have scratching uh, Hamlets and uh, and cooing uh, Juliets. No, no, I'm I'm talking, you know, share the space, you know, uh, with with these characters. Be think of yourself, uh, particularly once you have the lines and you've done the research. Think of yourself as uh, primary, uh, along with them, and mm. I think uh, you'll serve the play, serve yourself. It'll be a lot more fun. Oh, that's beautiful. That's great. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Um, I'm curious when you're not working, and it is great that you are, are still working a lot. Um, how do you spend your day? Are there certain rituals or habits you use or, or do? You know, I, I try to uh, when things have, are not going uh, well, or you, you're not having auditions, things you know, feeling a little antsy. I try to remind myself to do something for my body, something for my mind, and something for my spirit. So my body, it will be, uh, you know, yoga, uh, I go for a long hike, uh, it'll be uh, the gym, uh, you know, spirit, I'll do some, you know, I, uh, I try to do some meditation and, uh, and other, uh, other sort of questy things. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, for the mind, you know, I, I read plays, and I, I actually prefer in many ways to read nonfiction just simply because I find it, you know, we, we're, we have so many stories that uh, that's part of it, that it's, it's sort of interesting to, to read non, uh, you know, historical nonfiction uh, is useful. Um, and try not to take myself too seriously. The only, the only other thing that I probably learned is that I realize that come six o'clock on Friday, it's done. Okay. It's done for yeah. the weekend. There's yeah. nothing else you can do. Okay. You know, Unless you have a script to study or something, right. but so let yourself off the hook because you know, as young actors, we keep thinking, we keep looking. It's it's exhausting. Uh, I found myself uh, with a month or two off, and by the time I get a job, I'm so exhausted by the month or two off, not the job, that <laughs> I realize, you know what, you might want to lighten up a little bit, and uh, <laughs> you know, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, 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 it does, it does. Um, I'm curious what advice you would give to a smart, driven college student about to enter the real world of acting, and if you have any advice of or, or ideas of advice they should ignore. The first piece of advice I give is that, is that it's not a horse race. Just realize that the first one to the finish line, you're going to have people on your left and your right, your fellow students, et cetera, who, who may attain you know, uh, work or success or everything before you. Don't, don't let that... Uh, get you down or, or, or make you in any way feel less. Uh, that said, uh, you know, just surround yourself by people you respect, read, question, and by all means, work, work. I can't tell you the number of people who talk about really, really wanting to do plays, but then don't do plays. Right. You know? And so, um, I mean, there are a lot of actors in L.A. Who, who won't leave town to go do a play. And you're thinking, no, no, I understand, and I understand the... Uh, family commitment, all those, those are all good reasons to stay in town financially. But every so often, I think, you know, it's it's good to, to go out. Uh, I know for myself, when I reach the point in L.A. where I wouldn't hire myself, mm -hmm. I go off and do a play somewhere. Because, I, 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 you know, I think of it as a kind of, uh, I think of L.A., if you're not careful, as living off the interest of your talent and your experience, et cetera. And every mm -hmm. so often, you need to make a deposit. Sure. And that deposit can be, yeah, it can be at a place like Antius. Uh, it can be at other theaters in L.A. It can be in New York. It can be in the regions. It can be, uh, you know, a self-generated project. But it, you, you do need to uh, to work, I, I think, in a kind of way. 
Uh, and then there's a time for, for maybe not going out of town. But I think initially we're talking about the young actors. Sure, yeah. I think you, you do need to work. Okay. And also, particularly this is important, is that for the young actors coming to L.A. and New York and everything, some of them are there because they make sense at their age in a kind of way that their youth, their beauty, for whatever, they're very modern, they're the zeitgeist of the moment, whatever. You know, they make sense. And then there's going to be other people who, who don't make sense in their 20s and 30s and grow into themselves in their 40s and 50s. And you just need to realize that, um, that we're all very, very different. And um, there is no one version of the way to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, every, you know, you just, so if you surround yourself with, you know, and continue acting, take, take a class. I know it was really useful for me because I had, uh, you know, come into LA out of the regions uh, for 15 years. And it was all about these, you know, either heightened text or very, very um, respected plays, et cetera. And all of a sudden now I'm being handed, you know, a, a, something that was just off someone's typewriter. And you have to, learn how to deal with that new type of material. Perhaps your role is slightly different. Perhaps you can, it's not as sacred, if you will. That was one of the big things I worked on when I was taking class down here, was the director, you know, would always, a uh, teacher director would always say to me, you know, I, I never worry about that you're going to disrespect the text. As a matter of fact, let me see you disrespect the text <laughs> a lot more, you know, in class. Because, you know, it's, it's so interesting what actors can hide behind. Mm-hmm. We can hide behind all behavior and never really wanting to get to the text because, you know, the text is not really the expression of my mind. And and I'm so much deeper inside and we scratch and twitch. And then we can have equal hiding behind. No, I am a Shakespearean actor and I do not mess up with my diction. I do not. You know, everything is completely enunciated. Everything is, you know, I mean, we can find so many reasons of not going to essentially the truth of a character as we see it, as sure. we can experience it. You know, there's so many. So I would say, you know, take the journey. It's worth it. And it's it's not really about you. It's a kind of education. Mm. Uh, you can make your life as an actor about your own personal education as well as about the material you're doing. Because, I mean, you know, that's the great thing. Yeah. You know, uh, someone said one time, and I think it's really, really true, that sometimes we become actors out of a sense of mortality. Hmm. That as soon as you, you realize, oh my God, we only have so many years, so many things. If you realize that, what better profession than to be an actor? You know, where you could be a truck driver, a Shakespearean king, a, uh, a drug dealer, a lawyer, a judge, you know, I mean, what mm-hmm. better, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to, to really try on, you know. Really cram in so many different lives. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, and I thought, oh, you know, there's some, there's some truth in that. And generally, the neurosis and difficulty an actor feels is not, is not because of acting and the work. It's because of the lack of work. It's because of wanting to do these things and not having an opportunity. Right. And that's why I think it's important for you to, to, to find somewhere to do these things. Right. You know. Okay, so earlier you were talking, you kind of hinted at, uh, you know, projects don't always work out. You know, sometimes they fail. I'm curious, was there a failure that really kind of set you up later for success, or do you have a favorite failure of yours? Well, yeah, actually, uh, I'm not going to get very specific because there are people involved. (laughs) One of the reasons why I came to L.A., as a matter of fact, I I was supposed to do a play, uh, and we went out of the country to rehearse. It was sort of an international thing and other theaters, and I was supposed to do it, and it was a year long. And, uh, come to find out the director didn't, he didn't cast me. So, uh, and he didn't want me. <laughs> so it was sort of an awkward situation. So, uh, and it was so sort of oddly mishandled and I felt sort of abused, uh, that I didn't really want to do it in my heart. And yet my next year was mapped out with employment right. at, for this play. So if, if I said no, it meant I had nothing. But if I said yes, I, I felt like, I don't know, I just, I didn't, I felt, it just made me feel very, very uncomfortable, uh, the whole thing. So I, uh, that's what forced me to go to L.A., mm. if you will. I mean, that was, when I, when I made that choice, it was like, okay, 
because there was everything was cast already. You know, I could have stayed in San Francisco and said, "Oh, poor me! Look, I was mistreated." You know, or you know, and I, <laughs> who likes that? Right. And uh, so I decided to come to L.A. And the great thing about in L.A. is, if you're unemployed, you have a lot of company. <laughs> You see, if you're in the if you're up in San Francisco or in uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, and your community is theater, if you're unemployed, generally the you know the other actors are working at the various right. theaters, and you... <laughs> so uh, that so that was good bad luck. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I felt it was sort of a jolt to my uh, confidence, but ultimately, my God, uh, how how fortuitous it was to to come down when I did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like you were saying earlier. You never know how things are going to turn out. Well, Tony, thank you so much for your time, your generosity. This has just been a really, really wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And it was fun. Hey, guys. Nathan here one more time. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss anything ahead. Be sure to visit WorkingActorsJourney.com for additional info and links for items mentioned in today's episode, as well as all the episodes. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All the links are on our site and in the episode notes. Become a premium member and enjoy additional benefits and perks of the show, starting at just $2 per month. Head over to WorkingActorsJourney.com slash premium to join the Working Actors community. And don't forget to claim your free audiobook at workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Thanks again to today's guest and to everyone that makes these episodes possible. And a special thanks to you for listening. I'm Nathan Agin, and enjoy the journey.